morning. Welcome to those of you guys that are watching online. Uh, welcome if you're a newcomer today. Welcome home. You need to look no further. We're going to treat you like family. And we're going to have a great time helping you grow in God's kingdom and His grace. God has big plans for you. We're glad you're here. So uh, we're in this series, right, called Worship Junkies. This is week three. And the last couple weeks, we've covered some really cool stuff. The first week, part one, we talked about what is your go-to. We, you know, we talked about what a junkie is. We talked about uh, people who have bondages and addictions, you know, unfortunately, to, to things that are just so overwhelming and so overpowering in their life. Some people are addicted to, to drugs. Some people uh, run to alcohol when they're overwhelmed. Uh, maybe just if they if they just want to escape from reality, if they want time to stand still. Um, you know, some people go to food. Some people go to just even scrolling down Facebook just to, just to de-stress, right? Some people go for a walk. Some people exercise. Whatever whatever it is, the fact is is we all get overwhelmed with life. We all want time to stand still, we want to escape reality, and we all have a go-to. The fact is, whatever, show me whatever your go-to is, and I will show you your God. Whatever your go-to is, that is your God, because God wants to be your go-to, right? God wants to be His presence. He wants you to learn how to access His presence through worship, get into His presence, and, and He wants to be that go-to so that you can experience the peace and the joy and the fulfillment that only His presence can bring. Right, in part two, we talked about the process of addiction. We talked about how in order to get addicted to anything, you have to first have a hit or a sample, a free sample. And every week, every weekend here at this church, we give you samples of God's presence. The Bible says in Psalm 34, taste and see that the Lord is good. The Lord is good. We talked about Joshua, a guy who was so addicted to God's presence that when Moses and everybody else left the temple, Joshua stayed put. Joshua stayed put in God's house and God's presence. And this morning in part three, we're going to move on to the power of addiction. I want you to know this, that addictions are so powerful that it's just like this. God's presence, if you get addicted to God's presence, it will unleash a power in your life that you cannot even begin to comprehend. It will unleash a power in your life that you cannot even comprehend. Today we're going to talk about praise. And we're going to talk about the power in that. But before we do, if you'll bow your heads, we're going to open an order of prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your presence that's already residing in this place. God, I thank you that when we begin to lift our hands and we begin to cry out to you, Father God, your presence shows up. God, there's nothing that we long for more than God to be in your house and in your presence with your people. God, we pray today as we open your word, God, I pray that you would unveil to us, God, the power behind praise. God, that we would become addicted to it and we would begin to see those powers unleashed in our own lives. God, open our heart today and open our mind. God, let us receive all that you have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, uh, some guys by the name of Paul and Silas were in a town and they were ministering. They were telling people all about who Jesus was and why he came. And he was, they were performing all sorts of miracles. They were praying for people and people were getting healed. It was really, really awesome. But the entire time they were there, there was this woman that was following them around and bugging the daylights out of them. She was going in front of them all throughout the streets and she was saying... These guys are servants of the Most High God. And they're going to tell you how you can be saved. The thing, you think that sounds pretty good. The fact is that she was demon-possessed. And she was mocking them. She was making fun of them. And she was basically just being really sarcastic, going through all the streets, just being very flamboyant, very, very loud, very, very out of control. And, and, and this girl, you know, she had these demonic spirits in her that, uh, that kind of allowed her to uh, act as if she could tell the future. So she was kind of like a, like, a, like a palm reader or a fortune teller. And so the thing is, is she was making a lot of money for her master. She worked for these guys and they would work her in the streets telling people kind of what their future looked like. And, and there was, this was a big, big business for these guys. There was a lot of money to be made and they were really excited about their future in this business venture. As they were just annoying, you know, she was just annoying them and annoying them and annoying them for days. And all of a sudden, 
This is so funny. All of a sudden, Paul just gets really, really irritated with this woman that's demon possessed. And he just turns around. He's like, I've had it. In the name of Jesus, demon, I command you to come out right now. The demon left her. He's like, I'm done listening to this woman. I'm done listening to this demon in this woman. So he just commanded the spirit to leave. Here's what happened. Obviously, when that spirit left her, she no longer had the ability to continue doing what she was doing, parading around, acting like she could tell people's future. And so, immediately her masters realized, uh-oh, we're going to be out of business. And so they got really upset. And they said, well, let's scheme to get this guy thrown in jail. So they quickly pulled a bunch of people together in the city streets, and they formed a mob. Listen to what happened. In Acts 16, verse 22, it says, A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered that they be stripped and beaten with wooden rods. Tell me that wouldn't hurt. They were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into prison. The jailer ordered to make, was ordered to make sure that they never, ever, ever escaped. The jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in stocks. Around midnight, check this out. This is, this is awesome. Paul and Silas began praying around midnight. All right, what's everybody else doing at midnight? Sleeping. What were they doing? They were praying. And then it says they began singing hymns to God, you know? They were probably singing one of these worship songs. Oh, magnify, magnify the Lord together. Wasn't written yet, but if it was, I bet they were probably singing that song. Right? They started just lifting the roof off the place with worship. You know, they didn't, they didn't have any instruments. They didn't have speakers or a smoke machine or lights or, or any of this crazy stuff. All they had was their praise. They began praising God and they began praying and singing these songs of praise. And then what happens But it says the other prisoners were listening. And suddenly, there was a massive earthquake. And the prison was shaken to its foundations. All of the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open and he freaked out. Why? Because he was ordered to make sure that these prisoners did not Escape. And in that day and time, the same thing happened with the soldiers that were supposed to be guarding the tomb of Christ. If your prisoners got away, they just put you, they just sent you to death. Sometimes they even kill your family. So, I mean, who's going who's to really apply for that position? Who's going to send in their resume for that job? To say, you know what, it's a little pressure. You know, if my prisoners escape, I die. Um, probably not a good job to have. But nonetheless, this guy had that job. He wakes up, freaks out. He assumed that the prisoners had escaped. So the Bible says he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul was sitting there and he shouted, Stop! Don't kill yourself. We are all here. We're all here. The jailer called for lights. It means that it must have been pitch black. Ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out and asked. What do you think he asked? If I was the jailer, I would have said, how did you do that? But he didn't ask that. He didn't ask, he didn't ask how did you make an earthquake happen? How did you make all the stops fall off your feet and off your hands? How did you not walk out and leave so that I would have to kill myself? But this is what he asks. He said, Sirs, what must I do to you, sir? And they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. I want you to notice a few things about this story. This is one of the coolest stories. I mean, the Bible is so full of awesome, awesome stories. But this one I love. I want you to notice something. When Paul and Silas were out in the streets, they were doing what God had told them to do. They weren't doing anything wrong. They weren't doing things that caused them to get thrown in prison. They were doing what God had told them to do. All right? When sometimes when you're doing even what God has told you to do, you're going to tick other people off. You're going to tick off, most of all, the enemy. And when you do, listen to this, this is what began to happen. They were so mad when they arrested them and they took them in and they, they put them in the innermost 
part of the dungeon, so it's pitch black. It's damp and cold. Those dungeons were like in caves. So it's nasty, wet, and cold. There was no porta potty. There was nothing. There was nothing. Just think about that. Get the Disgusting, all right? They could have began to say, God, where were you? Why did you tell us to go out on the streets and preach and then turn your back on us? Why did you allow us to get arrested? Why did you allow us to get beat up and now thrown in a dungeon and putting our hands and our feet in stocks? Why, God, did you let this happen to me? They could have said that, right? What do you think God's response would have been to that? Not an earthquake. Not moving. Not releasing them. And definitely no salvation. Their, their response to their trial was this. God, thank you. God, thank you that we know you're still in control. God, thank you that even now in the pit of this dungeon, God, we know you're on the move. God, you're always up to something. God, you're going to move the mountain. God, we trust in you. And then they start singing in the dark. And the Bible says that everybody else is listening. The prisoners were listening. Let me tell you something. When you're going through a trial, you're going through that valley, you're going through those moments in your life where you don't understand, you're going through hard times, you're going through junk, and you're like, God, I'm doing what you told me to do. If you begin to praise God and you begin to say, thank you, God, for who you are, thank you, God, for what you've done in the past, thank you, God, that I know you're going to move in my circumstances right now. If you take that perspective, the world around you is going to stop and listen. Why do you think that is? Because that's not normal. Normal people grumble and complain and they grind and they say, man, when I get out of here, I'm going to give them what they have coming to them. That's what the flesh wants to do. Paul and Silas did the opposite of that. And because of that, not only did God move on their behalf, not only did God open the jail cells, and release them. But more importantly than all of that, the jailer and his entire household gave their lives to Jesus Christ. All because of Paul and Silas' response in the middle of their storm. You see, the response was this. When anything goes on in our lives, we're going we're gonna to worship God. Because the Bible says in Psalms 22 and 3, but God inhabits the praises of his people. I talked about this last week. That word inhabit means to dwell. It means in the middle of that jail cell in the dark, pit of the night, they wanted God's presence to come and dwell with them. So they knew that in order to get his presence, they were going to begin to say, God, we surrender to you. God, we trust you. God, we worship you in this place. And as soon as they did, God's presence surrounds them. You see, God's presence doesn't show up and then we worship. We worship and God's presence shows up. You're taking notes. You need to write that down because I'm telling you, if you're not going for a storm right now, you will. And when you do, you need to know this. You need to understand and not be saying, God, where are you? Where are you at, God? Why aren't you here? Why aren't you helping me? Why are you stopping the rain so I can bail my hay? Because dummy, your bail is going to catch on fire if I don't let it rain. So I'm going to let it rain on you. Now shut your mouth and thank me and praise me in my storm and you'll begin to realize down the road why I did what I did. Do you understand me this morning? Do you know that when you look back, you can see very clearly 2020 what God was doing. But when you're looking forward in a storm, it's really kind of dark and hazy. And all you can do is worship God. The Bible says in Psalms 104, we enter his gates with thanksgiving. We go into his courts with praise. We give thanks to him and we praise his name. We enter every situation the same. Every situation we enter with a thankful heart. Listen to me. A lot of times we're like, I'm thanking God right here to send my heart. He's so thankful. Paul and Silas opened their mouth. I've been told a lot of times in my mouth that my mouth gets me in trouble. Okay, I had to work on that as I got older. I'm still working on that. But let me tell you something. I'm losing my point. Let me tell you something. Are you making faces? <laughs> And did you see that? She struck me. <laughs> Can you hear my words? That was open handed, baby. It could have been worse. Listen to me. God gave you a voice to open your mouth and pray Him. Paul and Silas did not sit there in silence. Just pray in their heart. Thank you, Jesus. In my heart. No! They opened their mouth so that everybody. 
that God had given them a voice to praise Him in that moment. Listen to me. Worship and praise are action words. This is not action. Action is doing something. You know what's sad? I see people get more excited in their living room over a ball game than I do in the house of God over what God has done for them. There's a problem in our thinking. Where we now, hey, I'm a fool at a ball game. All right? My, you can go She's to any game. She is a fool. You can ball. go to any game my kids play, and you don't have to know where we're sitting. You will hear me, and you will know. Oh, there's my family right over there. I'll just go. <laughs> driving down the road. Do people think you're crazy because you're waving at everybody when really you're not waving? Really? You're just worshiping? Sorry. Listen to me. You want God to start moving in your life. You want God to start doing amazing things. Do you know that every miracle in the Word of God first had a problem before a miracle? You can't have God moving in your life if you don't have a trial. You can't have God moving in your life and having big miracles if you don't learn how to have victory and that comes through your praise. So, I want you to see your life as your whole lifespan as an entire war. And at the end of that war, the question is, have you won the war or have you lost the war? And how many of you guys know that in a war, it's really made up of nothing but many, many little, what, battles, right? And sometimes, guess what, sometimes we might lose a battle. Sometimes we might give into the flesh. Sometimes we might make a bad decision. We knew it was the wrong decision. We did it anyway. And we escape from the victory. We don't experience the victory like God wants us to experience the victory. But if we will see a victory in battle after battle after battle after battle after battle, then when the war is done, we will have won the entire war. How many of you guys want to win the war? So, that was pathetic. So, um, so, thank you, thank you. So then we have to understand what it takes to get victory in our lives. What do you think of? What's the word picture that you think of when you think of the word victory? When you think of victory, do you, do you, do you see yourself as a champion? Do you see yourself as a warrior, one who has completely won the fight, won the battle? You see yourself as someone strong, someone who has, who has overcome? Listen to me. Praise precedes victory yeah. in your life. Yeah. Praise precedes, yeah. it goes before victory in your life. So if you want victory... Every single time, you've got to learn how to praise your way through circumstances. The fact of the matter is, most people in the church couldn't praise their way out of a wet paper bag. <laughs> but that's okay. Because that's why you're here. This is Praise Training 101. And if that's you, you're saying, he's speaking to me. I can't praise my way out of a wet paper bag. And we're going to teach you today and next week how to praise your way more than a wet paper bag experience. We're going to teach you how to have victory in your circumstances. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that everything in your life is going to be perfect and it's all going to go the way you want it. In fact, it's probably the opposite. It's not going to go the way you want it at all. The fact is, you're going to position yourself for God to move mightily in your life. I mean, you think Paul and Silas were preaching this prosperity message. If you just serve the Lord, everything's going to be perfect. It's all going to be hunky-dory. Right? Is that what they were saying? No! They were, they were in prison with no porta potty and it was dark and stinky, and they were shackled up. That's going to happen in your life. You are going to have prison moments in your life. When you feel like, what? Okay, let's survey. What have I done wrong? How have I hacked you off, God? Because this is hell on earth. But don't you know that God gives you those circumstances to refine you and perfect you and strengthen you and stretch you and make you who He wants you to be? If life was perfect, there'd be no opportunity for growth. To change and, and to become stronger. It's like you want to you want to get strong, but you don't ever want to go to the gym and work out. How stupid is that? And do you not know that it's painful? I've seen this woman about fall down the stairs out the front door of the gym because she did a leg workout. She couldn't walk, and she about fell down the stairs. 
Did I help her? No, I didn't help her. She was grovelling on the ground and I was being entertained like a loser husband. But it was funny. But you gotta, it, it causes pain when you really, really test and try your muscles. And that's exactly what God wants to do with you in your life. So praise precedes victory. So what is praise really? We talk about worship and that's expressing how much God is worth to you, right? It gets more intimate. It gets more personal of you saying, God, I, I, you are so unbelievably worthy and I love your presence and it's expressing how valuable he is to you. But praise is really expressing how thankful you are for who he is and what he has done, what he is doing, and what he is about to do right. in your life. Praise yeah. is different. Praise is different. Praise means to commend or applaud or magnify. It's really more of a time of celebration to get God's attention, right? Now, why would Paul and Silas be praising in a prison? Why would they be celebrating? If the victory in their moment was those shackles coming off their hands and their feet, and if praise precedes victory, they must have known something. They must have known that if they praised God, that the victory was soon to come. And the same, the same as in your life and in my life, we've got to learn how to praise our way out of every circumstance. Praise precedes victory. Listen to different ways that the Bible tells us we can, can express to God through praise and worship. There's so much action involved. Misty was touching on it just a little bit ago. And in some instances, believe it or not, it's okay to be still. And it's okay to be quiet. We're going to talk about that. Hebrews 13 and 15 says that we can verbally give thanks to God in times of praise and worship. Okay? Now, as I read through these, I want you to think about what it looks like in your experience, in your time, when you're, when you're here standing in front of your seat and, and, and you're worshiping. You're praising God. Or if you're at home and you've taken that 15-minute challenge or you, you're doing your alone time, maybe for us it's an hour of power. It's like we are going to spend time in your presence what does it look like for you? Hebrews 13 and 15 says that we are to verbally give thanks to God. Psalms 47 verse 1 says, clapping hands and shouting. I didn't know you were supposed to clap your hands and shout in church. It's, but it's scriptural. Now I'm not saying if I'm not saying if you don't clap and you don't shout like you're going to hell or something. I'm not saying that. That's pretty dramatic. It's pretty extravagant, but 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 we're seeing here that it does take action. But you're saying, I don't feel like that. I don't feel like clapping my hands. I don't feel like shouting. Well, guess what? It's not about you. <laughs> it's, it's not for you. It's for him. I've asked you if you want to clap your hands. <laughs> God wants a gift from you and from me as we praise Him, as we worship Him. It's not about us. It's what we're giving Him. It's what we're giving Him. Musical instruments and dancing. How many of you guys can cut it up? I mean, how many of y'all can get down, right? Right? I think that we should have an interpretive dance competition some Sunday morning here at the church. Just get the worship going and see who can really dance. Right? David, King David, came dancing through the city streets and his wife was like, you are an idiot. That's what she said. For some reason, that sounds familiar. <laughs> I don't know what it is about it. It just kind of has a familiar ring to it. I don't know. She fits. What you say? <laughs> so David came dancing through the town celebrating. Do you know why he was dancing through the town? If you read that scripture, he had just... He had just been, ready for it, Obed Edom, this town, and he had temporarily taken the Ark of the Covenant. God's presence was in this box, if you will. Long story, look it up. But God's presence was temporarily being kept. It was, it was, it was, it was being held at Obed, at Obed Edom, and he realized there for the few months while God's presence was there, like, they started just experiencing all sorts of blessings. Like, like, seriously, God began to severely bless that town. And you're like, what's the common denominator? God's presence was the common denominator. Wherever God's presence is, right, there is fullness of joy, there is liberty, there is freedom, right? There is hope. 
And that's exactly what they were experiencing. So David said, I think I'm going to go get that God's presence and bring it back home so we can have this for ourselves. We want to have a real relationship with God. So he went and got God's presence and brought him into the town. And when he came in, man, they had tambourines. Don't you bring a tambourine to this church. They had a band. They had worshipers. They were praising. They were dancing. They were singing. They were shouting. They were celebrating, giving thanks to God for who He is, what He had done, what He was doing, what He was about to do. They were praising and thanking God. The same really fits for us, whether we're here worshiping God publicly or whether we're worshiping, worshiping God privately. God responds to such praise and worship. Ephesians 5, 19-20 talks about psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Psalms 98, 4 talks about making a joyful noise. The Word talks about lifting our hands. The Bible talks about being still, right? In Psalm 4, 3, and 5. And, and, and Misty and I have been in some amazing, amazing worship experiences and times where just it was us and God and we have felt God's presence so thick and He has spoken to us in amazing ways. Just spoken to the very depths of our hearts about our life or about others in those moments when we just shut up and just sit still and just let God just speak. There's times for that. But there's also times for everything else and there has to be a balance. And the more you grow in your, in your uh, worship, the, more, the deeper you get in being a junkie, right? You will learn in those moments how to respond to God and what God expects from you. There's times where we are to be loud as well. And so, you know, all of these, all of these examples that I gave just now are expressions where we can take we can take these expressions to God. It's a form of action to say, God, I love you so much. Or God, thank you so much. Or God, I magnify you. I, I exalt you. I, I invite you to come into this place because I can't do life without you. I refuse to do life without you. What we're talking about in this series is about being a worship junkie, getting addicted to the presence of Almighty God. John chapter 4, verse 23 says, But the time is coming. Say, the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship Him that way. Okay, so we're talking about a creepy God. Right? We've talked about this before. God is creepy because He thinks about you and stays awake while you're sleeping. He watches you sleep and He loves you, but He stays awake at night watching you because He's a creepy God. And this creepy God who loves you so much is also seeking after people. He is looking for people, true worshipers, who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. You know what that means in a nutshell? It means that you would connect with your Creator you would open yourself wide up and you would be so transparent before the Lord. You would just show Him everything. I mean, you can see it all anyway, right? He, know, he knows it all anyway, but it's you unveiling it to Him. It's you willingly, voluntarily laying yourself on the surgery table and saying, examine my heart. Look and search within me and see if there be anything at all that you think is imperfect or unclean or out of place. And I want you to call me on it. Because God, I, I, I want to be as much like Jesus as I can possibly be. I want to look like Him, smell like Him, think like Him, talk like Him. I want to be as close to Jesus as I possibly can. Because you realize the closer we get to being more and more like God, which by the way, we'll never get there. But He wants us to strive with everything in our being. To try to get as close to Him and as much like Him as possible so that we can truly worship Him. Because in those moments, when you, when you just lay it all out, God begins to minister. This is crazy. Are you ready for this? God, God not only shows up, but He begins to work things out in your life that you don't even have to pray about. Like, seriously. 
You don't even have to take these things to prayer. I mean, you, you should. Biblically, the Word says to take your needs to the prayer, to take your needs to the Lord. But, but in many cases, as you learn to be a worship junkie, and you just begin to dig into His presence, just love God and love people, God just naturally takes care of all your side junk. Just begins to take care of it. He just begins to work things out. Because praise precedes victory. Yeah. As we're wrapping it up today, there's a, there's a story in 2 Chronicles that is so powerful that we had to share it this morning with you. And I want you, if you have your word, go to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. You know, the Old Testament is a lot of war. That's just what was going on. Israel was always going out to battle. And if you like war movies, man, you'll love the Old Testament. Okay? Well, I want you to know in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 15 through 22, and I, I try to cut this down because I'm like, man, Brad, I don't really want to read it all. There's not a part of it I can cut out. You, you have to listen, all right? If you haven't, listen to me. If, if you think we're a little long today, smack yourself around. You've got to hear this. There's some of you who need this this morning. Listen to me. This is God, and he said, he said, listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Side note, Judah needs praise, all right? Listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Listen, King Jehoshaphat. This is what the Lord says. Undermine me in your Bible. God is speaking to some of you right now. Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army. Listen, for the battle is not yours, but it's God's. Tomorrow you're going to march out against them. You'll find yourself coming up against them. I'm going to skip over to verse 17. But you will not need to fight. Listen to me. You may be in a battle this morning. You may be going through some junk. You don't know how you're going to get out of And God is saying to you, first of all, don't you be afraid. Don't be discouraged. And you won't even need to fight. This battle is not yours. He says, take your positions. Stand still and watch the Lord's victory. He is with you. He goes down in verse 18 and it says, Then King Jehoshaphat, he bowed down to his face to the ground. And all the people of Judah and Jerusalem did the same and they worshipped God. Then the Levites from the clan of Kohath and Korah, they stood to praise God, the God of Israel, with a very loud shout. Pay attention. This, they know they're getting ready to go out for battle. They're in the midst of it. They're getting ready to go out. God has already promised them they have the victory. And what do they do? They all bow down and they start to worship. Then they get up, they raise their hands, they start shouting. And it says this, verse 20. Early the next morning, the army of Judah, they went out into the wilderness. And on their way, Jehoshaphat stopped. And he said, hold up. And he heard me listen up right here. All the people of Judah and Jerusalem, you got to listen to me. Believe in the Lord your God and you will be able to stand firm. He goes on and he says, the king appointed singers. Listen to this. The king appointed singers to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising him in all of his splendor and saying, Give thanks to the Lord for his mercy and his faithful love endures forever. At that very moment they began to sing and give praise and the Lord caused the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Sire to start fighting against themselves and God gave them the victory and they never had to lift a finger except to praise. Listen to me. Listen to me. If you can get anything out of this, guys, praise precedes victory. People begin to grumble and they complain. Listen, Israel tried it in the Old Testament. They would grumble and they would complain over their circumstances and it got them nowhere. It got them nowhere. Every time God moved, and He moved because people began to praise Him. He moved because people began to worship Him. He moved when people began to say, God, you are good. You are faithful. God, I know you moved in my past, and God, you're going to move in the right now and in my future. And you begin to praise your way through your trials. You begin to praise your way through your storms. Is that easy to do? No, because it doesn't come natural. What comes natural is when you stub your toe to scream and to say a bad word. That's not what God wants you to do. When you're going through junk, what comes natural is for you to grumble and complain, I can't believe this is happening in my life. I don't deserve this. This is not what should be happening right now in my life. But God's response, the supernatural response of God's people, is to say, God, you're in control. Right, right. I challenge you this week. Put it to the test. Try it. Now, I'm not going to pray God will give you trials. They'll come on their own, right? But when you do, 
you better have already been practiced up. So right now, if you're not going through a trial, I challenge you this week. Get up every day and say, Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. God, I thank you. There's not a day that I don't roll out of bed without it coming off my lips. God, thank you for this day. God, thank you. I have air in my lungs today. This may be my last, and I definitely am going to be thanking God as I leave this earth. Every moment that you have, guys, is a gift from God. Praise your way through your storms. You guys would stand up with me today. We want to challenge you with this. Be a person of praise. Be a person of thanksgiving. A person that is just a junkie. At magnifying God. At being thankful for who God is. At, at giving God your just your, your everything. At expressing to God how thankful you are in your life. Become a person who, who is expressive enough to show God, hey, I want your attention. You know? For some of you in this place, you might say, Pastor, it's really uncomfortable for me to raise my hand. This isn't a, this isn't a legalistic thing. This is a personal challenge to you. That God is saying, I want you to humble yourself before me, and I want you to give me a gift from you to show me how thankful you are for who I am. For what I've done in your life, what I'm doing in your life, what I'm about to do in your life. Maybe God wants you to learn to shout. Maybe, maybe, maybe God wants you to be a person who can dance your way out of circumstances. To sing to God. Whatever it is, God wants you to be a person of praise because praise precedes victory. And you are going to need victory in your life. Battle after battle after battle after battle after battle. We're all going to have to learn to be really, really thankful and to express that to God and to learn to celebrate. Come into His courts with thanksgiving. With praise. Amen. And God is going to unleash the power of His presence in your life. And you will never be the same again. Let me pray for you. For those of you who want that in your life, just raise your hands right now to heaven and just say, God, I want that. Make me a person of praise, God. Let praise precede me, God, in battle after battle after battle. Will you do that right now? Will you be honest before the Lord and yourself? And just raise your hands and just say, God, I want to be a person of praise. Father, in the name of Jesus, right now, I pray for every individual in this place, God, that has a heart to please you and to honor you, Father God. I pray, God, that you would allow us to, to develop such a, a beautiful song for you, Father God. And, and to amplify our voices that as we magnify the name of Jesus, not only in this church publicly, but privately in our times of private praise. God, let us be people of praise. Let us learn to be thankful and to express our thanksgiving to you, Father God. Let us give your attention and give you a gift that says we trust in you. You're worthy. We honor you. We are thankful, God, for you and for everything you're doing. God, make us a people of praise. Your head's bowed and your eyes closed. You may be in this place and you may say, I don't even have a real relationship with God. I don't feel like I can praise God because I need to come into a relationship with God. I know that I've done things in my life that have displeased God and I want to make it right. I can tell you that the best decision I ever made in my life was surrendering to Jesus Christ. This morning we want to give you that opportunity. We want to leave you in an opportunity right now to just say, Father, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. I want to live for you for all eternity. God has promised you eternity in heaven for those who have made the Lord of their life. You can't praise your way out of anything if Jesus is at the center of your world. This morning, if you're here with all heads bowed, all eyes closed, you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life. You want a real relationship with Him. 
I'm going to count to three and I want you to just raise your hands. No one's looking around. We're not going to call you out. We don't want to embarrass you, but as your pastors, we do want to know who you are. Because we want to celebrate with you your decision to make Jesus the Lord of your life. If you're in this place, and that's you, I want you to raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. Hey man, I see your hands. I see your hands. Thank you, Jesus. Greatest decision you'll ever make. I see your hands. Thank you, Father God. As a church body, we do everything together. Today, we are going to lead each other in this prayer. If you'll follow me, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. Come into my heart. Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of my sin. I want to live for you. I want to live for you. Every day. Every day. From this day forward. From this day forward. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Yes. Well, give him a hand and praise this morning. Thanks so much for joining us today. If you want to be a part of something bigger than yourself, give to our ministry. We've made giving easy here at Mountain Movers Church. If you have your smartphone, just text the number 918-223-8090. Just push in the amount you want to give and push send. It's that easy. If you don't have your smartphone, not a problem. You can mail your giving just as easy to 24,000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma 74344. Thanks for watching today. Hey, remember, we're dreaming big for you. We'll see you next week.